met Paul Bartell at a recruitment at an elementary school. I was fresh out of college and wasn't sure what my path was going to be in life. I just saw him working with those kids and playing his instrument. Now Big Bo and Paul Bartell. It was just so inspiring to see him work with those kids and see their faces light up over music and the violin. In the fall, I go all through northern Kentucky. I take my electric violin, I do wild and crazy things, and I recruited about 300 kids this last fall in northern Kentucky, all for the NKU program. We do tours here on a fairly regular basis. I have them come from states away, literally anywhere from 10 or 15 to 120 kids at a time. Upstairs people, go upstairs and start your scavenger hunt. I like them to use their eyes and look around and see and find things. Then we talk about what they find. Then we do a history lecture on the history of the violin. Then we go upstairs and we actually talk about making a violin. My favorite thing to do is to hand the kids this pile of wood and ask them what they're holding, but I'll preface it with who has foresight, which is a word they don't know. So the first word that comes out of their mouth is, well, that's wood. Finally, one of them will say, oh, I know, I know, I know. And I'll hand it to them and they'll, they'll say, this is a violin. I come from a, a family of musicians. My father was a musician, my grandfather was a musician. And luckily I picked up that musical gene so that when I picked up the violin, it was a real natural thing for me. Uh, and because of that, it, it really changed my life. My hobby was finding these instruments, fixing them and repairing them. Not trying to sell them, just finding them, fixing them and repairing them. We all have a little collectible bug in us. And, that was my collection. And it came time for me to buy a house and found that I could sell what I'd been collecting and uh, make my down payment. My hobby became my business, so I'm one of those fortunate people that love to go to work every day. After we hear about, there's a few hairs that don't conform. Then a little bit of heat applied to them can draw them up tight. And God. A lot of kids come in with real hard pieces and they, they sit down and they'll try to play a concerto to try out a violin. That's not the way you try out a violin. You take it one string at a time. You just listen to that string. So you got a bright E string. And you have this dark G string. And it's the job of the middle two strings to get you from the dark to the bright in an even sound. And then we do a scale. Then they can go around and do whatever they want to. But first they have to, to listen to those four strings. If I give you oils and canvas, can you make me a Rembrandt? If I give you a pencil, can you sketch a Picasso for me? If I give you blocks of wood, can you make a Stradivarius? The answer is no. It was the genius the man. Stradivarius never made any two instruments the same. He was constantly striving to make something better, and he constantly did. I spent many a night up here in the shop late at night making this violin. It's not a bad sounding violin. When I, I had the Lady Harmsworth, this is a copy of the Lady Harmsworth, I, I took it to Perlman when he was in Cincinnati, and I said, would you like to see my Strad? I've got a nice golden period Strad. And he, and he was very gracious and said, sure, absolutely. Took me to his dressing room. And when he played my violin, I stood there and I was stunned and amazed because I'd never heard my violin played like that by anybody else. And everyone and their mother had been into my shop and played that violin. But Perlman was the first one that really showed me what that violin could do. And for the rest of my time, I've been trying to emulate that sound, and I'll never be able to because I'm not Perlman. I'm Paul Bartel. That's my violin. <laughs>